Cool. All right. So yeah, maybe like we usually do, John Perry, just kind of start off with a little bit of your background, kind of how you how you got to where you are now, and then uh, you can go through and start answering some of those questions that the students have. All right. Very good. So I'm Jean Pierre Wolf, and uh, I'm the uh, owner and uh, vintner at uh, Wolf Vineyards. And uh, I do have a uh, engineering and scientific background. And actually, when I was uh, uh, 18 years old, I wanted to pursue a four-year degree in in uh, agronomy. And then after my first year. I switched to nuclear engineering. I just thought I was a cool thing to do. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, life went on and went back to the roots of my original interest. In uh, uh, 20 years ago, acquired uh, this vineyard, which is 125 acres. And uh, it was strictly planted with Chardonnay, uh, about 55 acres. And, and it has been uh, ongoing uh, working progress, but uh, I would say that yeah, after 20 years, uh, increasingly realized that uh, it's all about adaptation. Because you know, you could think, well, you have done this 20, 20 years, so you know what you're doing. Well, maybe, maybe not. In fact, I was talking to one of my customers has been buying fruit from us here for the past 25 years, which means even five years before I acquired the vineyard. And he's been making wine for about 35 years. And, you know, he's, he's a very well-recognized winemaker. In fact, uh, Wine Spectator, top 100 wines in the world. Mm. And uh, he said, you know, Jean-Pierre, I've never gone through this. This is all new, uh, you know, he's, his winery is in the Santa Cruz mountain. And as mm. we speak, we do have quite a few fires in the area. So he said the fires were about 15 or 15 miles away from him. Mm. And he's on a mountain ridge. And he said the whole thing, he said, we already started harvesting earlier than usual. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, as part of the conversation we're gonna have today about uh, growing practices, sustainability, I think increasingly we need to emphasize the importance of adaptation and, uh, sure. and being, uh, becoming very good at handling changes. So that's my little intro. Cool. Awesome. So what is some of the restoration work that's been done at Wolf Vineyards? Uh, what are some of the things that you've done here to benefit specific organisms um, on your property? All right, so uh, when we acquired the vineyard, uh, you know, I, I very quickly realized the, uh, the value and, and the importance of uh, improving some of the environmental farming practices that were used. I would say that the farming was utilizing more traditional methods. Uh, for instance, uh, it was quite a significant uh, infestation of mealybugs on the property. And, uh, you know, diazinon was the go-to, which is a class one pesticide. I call it nuking the vineyard. You know, you kill everything. So I saw that, I'm like, there's gotta be a better way. And also we, we we have creeks on both sides of our property. One is a, a named tributary to West Corral de Piedra, and the other creek is uh, West Corral de Piedra Creek, both of which then discharge in uh, Pismo Beach. So mm -hmm. those of you familiar with Pismo Beach, there's a little estuary which discharge in the ocean. Well, the main stems of, uh, of these streams comes from here. So it's a steelhead trout a migratory stream. So when I looked at that, I'm like, okay, th that's an area of improvements to make. So uh, I worked closely then with the uh, uh, SEAS, the California Conservation Corps, uh, with Fish and Wildlife, with NOAA, and, uh, and then uh, uh, 
Centrical Salmon Enhancement mm -hmm. and then the uh, California Salmon Federation. And it, you know, it takes a village to make things happen. And, you know, although I had a very strong interest, I certainly could not profess that I knew what I had to know uh, for steelhead trout restoration pro projects. So we did quite a few interesting things, including uh, bioengineering solutions, which is utilizing more natural ways of improving embankments. The old traditional method was uh, gabions, for example, which are putting big rocks in, in, in mm -hmm. uh, wire mesh cages. You, you may have seen those. Yep. That was the go-to in the, in the 60s. Uh, before the 60s and in the 50s, the, <clears throat> the go-to was uh, taking you used tires and put them on the embankments. And in fact, uh, when we did restoration, there was a whole section that was, you couldn't see them, but they were all tires that had been laid flat. Huh. And um, so that was another hmm. means of restoration in the 50s. And then another example in uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Tributary Creek, when we did some cleanup, there was a uh, Volkswagen minibus, you know, one of the old green things mm -hmm. that was in the creek, and that was uh, a method of erosion control in those days. You wow. know, you put cars on the side. Sure. So yes, a lot of respirations uh, involved. So, but that was one. It was certainly. Uh, a, in the, the creek sites and then uh, <clears throat> other areas of interest that we had was to improve also the uh, uh, bird habitat so we did plant pardon me we did install bird boxes for kestrel barn owls and perch for red tail hawk in fact for barn owl we have about uh, probably about a, a dozen boxes and we okay. have residents in everyone no kidding you can tell because you look at the bottom uh, <laughs> of the, the pole and you have all these little skeletons yeah, so yeah. you know you have activity and then you see also the little feathers from the young ones so, so that's a huge benefit for you because they're controlling gophers and squirrels. You know what? They do a better job than some of my employees who <laughs> are supposed to do gopher control. Uh, yeah. They're very efficient and, uh, and, and they're at it seven days a week. So, uh, so that was another area uh, that we, we were involved with. And, and, and also by reducing uh, the use of and eliminating the use of uh, pesticides and and having buffer strips along creeks etc vegetative strips what what it does is your whole eco uh, ecology chain changes uh, 20 years ago rarely did we have quail sightings mm -hmm. uh, today we do have an abundant amount of quails around and other wildlife ranging from opossums to uh, uh, we we have also bobcats mm. uh, and uh, right now the deers come down from the hills because they're looking for food and for water uh, we ha we also had a pond a natural pond which we improved the uh, the area to make it a little um, a little oasis so to speak for wildlife and uh, the water in the pond is strictly for beneficial use so we do have migratory birds coming there and uh, also california pacific pond turtle mm. um, so that was another effort environmental effort and and then on a smaller scale beneficial insects so we did quite a few projects of uh, putting insectaria which is basically planting uh, a mix of wildflowers, native wildflowers between rows, and those do attract the beneficial cool. insects. So that has been pretty effective. Uh, the challenge once in a while has been uh, the um, uh, the fact that the uh, the rabbits love the, oh, okay. uh, uh, the wild the wildflowers. So, um, in terms of other other uh, areas uh, that we have been focusing on as well, 
is uh, uh, water quality and, uh, and the water quantity. And so we did uh, modify some of our uh, irrigation techniques in order to improve the efficiency of the irrigation systems. And we also had, oh, it was 19 years ago, uh, did quite a bit of earthwork to capture st stormwater runoff, mm -hmm. which is called sheet flow. And uh, did this way before uh, or historical droughts and uh, way before the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act requirement, uh, which took place uh, just about four years ago. So we capture some of the stormwater runoff from our hills mm -hmm. and uh, we flood the lower uh, fields, uh, which basically act as, as uh, rice paddies. So mm -hmm. I do have uh, little culverts so the water goes from one block to the next to the next. Try to get as much of the water going in, in the ground before uh, exiting into the creek. And that has helped us in some areas to uh, dry farm, but only during normal rain years. You know, when you have extreme droughts uh, and you're at uh, uh, 40 percent of annual rainfall, that doesn't work, you know, because many, many times we have had customers say, oh, Jean-Pierre, you're so lucky, you know, you dry farm. <laughs> I say, you know what, dry farming only works when it rains. Yeah, sure. And they're like, oh, yes, I guess you're right. Yeah. yeah, so that's the next question, actually, if you want to jump, just jump into that, you know, what are, what are the benefits of dry farming when you can do it? So when you can, some of the benefits of dry farming are uh, deep, are we okay with the sound or? I should be okay. okay. Oh. Otherwise, otherwise, we're we're going to be having Cheryl give the class. <laughs> yeah, it usually picks up closer, better than further away, so hopefully it'll be all right. Yeah, so, uh, and besides, you can do little... Yeah, captions cutting. or whatever. Exactly. So, uh, what, one of the uh, as benefits of dry farming is that when, when you encourage roots to go deep in the ground, uh, you pick up a lot more uh, micronutrients and minerals at different layers because the soil is really not homogeneous, so you'd have different layers. So you pick up a, 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 a richer variety of uh, minerals, mm -hmm. benef benefiting the, uh, uh, the, f the vine, enhance the flavors. Other benefits is generally a, s a smaller crop. And this is a situation where you sacrifice quantity for quality. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you dry farm, typically you will not necessarily reduce the clusters per vine, but the cluster weight per vine. So, you know, the fruiting shoots, don't, unless you have extreme struggling, uh, but the fruiting shoots will still have, you know, the average count, but it'll be the cluster weight. Mm. So smaller cluster, uh, meaning uh, smaller berries, because typically the number of berries is going to be pretty much unchanged, but the size of the berries will. So now you have a higher ratio of skin and pulp, uh, which will give you a, a much more intense flavors. Mm. So that's one another benefit. Another one is that you will have less variation year to year in terms of the taste profile. The taste profile tends to remain pretty much the same uh, from year to year. <laughs> Hold on. Cheryl, if you don't mind, we're doing a class, so yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's okay. You're, you're, you're already part of the class now. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, the other benefit is is your taste profile does not change a whole lot from year to year. Mm -hmm. And I can prove that. For example, Bourg Chardonnay, where from 
every year you do have sort of that same signature in, in the taste. Yes, you may have a little variation of pH and TA, you know, from year to year, uh, but the fundamentals are the same. So that's, that's another, another benefit uh, which tends to be more qualitative driven. Uh, the quantitative benefits, of course, are water savings. Uh, so that that's that's a big difference, and I would say, particularly when also you're experiencing droughts, in uh, you know, or 20 years, this is about a third one mm. of serious droughts. Older vines, in vines that have been trained to become more drought resistant, have a little more resiliency uh, during the droughts. Um, because of the deep root system. Uh, also, often, you know, when we look at drought, we say, well, you know, no shortage of water, so the vine is stressed because of lack of water. There's another big element, uh, which is, I would say, sometimes equally as important, and that's the salt tolerance. Mm. Because when we look at annual rainfall, the, the rain flushes the salt uh, from the soil. And uh, when you do have several years of droughts and uh, reduced irrigation because of the needs to conserve the aquifer and your wells dangerously dropping mm -hmm. in water table level, uh, you can reach uh, toxicity to the plant tissue. Mm. And uh, grapevines, just like other permanent crops, do have a finite uh, tolerance for uh, salt buildup. Even other crops, strawberries, when we were at the height of a drought, mm -hmm. uh, strawberries uh, toxicity was manifesting itself with burnt leaves. Mm -hmm. And then it was reducing chlorophyll production and actually negatively impacted the ripening of the strawberries. It was a big problem. Mm. Uh, and we need to remember that uh, anytime we apply fertilizer, we apply salt. Doesn't matter if it's uh, organic fertilizer or chemical fertilizer. Mm -hmm. If you put a compost, you're putting, you're putting salt. Sure. So that's Having said that, if you have a deeper root system, uh, the amount of surface salt intake by the plant mm. is a little bit reduced, meaning if you have uh, root zones which are two and a half feet below ground, and you do have that zone of high salt content versus a root that is five, six feet below ground, mm -hmm. you do have quite a bit of a difference. And it would take a significant amount of rainfall for that salt to go down. Well, then when it occur and you have the El Nino, that flushing takes place and, mm -hmm. it, and it's really a transient stage rather than a permanent stage in the root zone. Interesting. So uh, what, uh, what the annual rainfall do you need to, to, go, to do good dry farming? Is there a certain number you've come up with over the years? Well, okay, let's start with what the annual rainfall, uh, the average rainfall is in Vietnam Valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, uh, the 50 year average is uh, uh, 22 and a half inches. But it's also the adaptation of, of the vines to these average and in recent years, what we're seeing is a significant variation uh, of, of extremes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you know, California, we talk about climate change, obviously, and the impact in California, and, and this is not John Pierre saying this, it's climatologists, it's NOAA, it's NASA, in California, if we take 10 years span, we have about we have about the same amount of rainfall 
cumulatively over mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's the same. However, what's happening, it's all, you're going, you have several years with very little rain, and then you have one or two year events mm -hmm. of big rains. So the big challenge is how do we adapt to these, these extremes? Mm -hmm. Of course, putting also aside the fact that uh, our, our snowpack is going to be reduced because it's going to be coming into rain rather than snow and you'll also have premature melting of the snow. That's not so much impacting our viticulture here because the central coast is not reliant on the California aqueduct. Right. It, this, the, the, the business model for farming in the central coast is totally different from the, the business model of water use in the central valley. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll give you an interesting statistic. And I define the Central Coast from San Mateo County to Ventura County, okay? 82% of the water is from groundwater extraction in the Central Coast, mm. 82%. Wow. So we're highly reliant. You know, the balance is from uh, the uh, state water delivery that provides a little bit of water in Paso, there's a little bit that's going San Luis and mm -hmm. Santa Barbara, etc. But that's li literally and figuratively a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. Where in the Central Valley, you're reliant on on the aqueduct. Mm -hmm. But you know, when we had the extreme droughts, their allocation was down to 15 percent. So how do you farm with that? Right. So one of the things that we will do is. We're not just going to have this little conversation where I comfortably sit and, and your uh, professor also comfortably sit hold, holding the video camera. We will actually go in the field and I will show some of these uh, new projects that were involved and, and how I'm using uh, you know, technology to leverage a little bit um, the important aspect of water. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my pitch about water and increasingly when we talk about uh, farming as a whole, water is, is becoming the main issue next to labor. Mm. These are the two big elements. Putting, putting COVID-19 aside, mm -hmm. putting the current econo economics aside, but that's the biggest challenge that um, you know as, as farmers we're all going to be yeah. experiencing so when we look at water you know the, the, the long-term solution in my view it's about water conservation augmentation and innovation Conservation alone is not going to address our uh, water issue in the state and mm -hmm. how we address climate change. But certainly is, a, is, is an important element to address, meaning moving from overhead sprinklers to drip to tape, tape uh, drip systems, etc., microameters. Augmentation is basically subcase recycled water. Uh, it's also capturing stormwater, mm -hmm. which is what I discussed a little bit earlier. In fact, currently there are a lot of studies looking at high percolation area and how can we divert stormwater in those mm -hmm. areas to infiltrate into the ground. And then the third one is innovation. And I'm a strong believer that, uh, you know, as human beings, we, we're survivalists. And, and we, ha we can leverage technology in order to make improvements. But you need all three. Sure. One by itself is not going to be the solution. So it's a three-legged stool in mm -hmm. a sense you know, on how we can stabilize uh, our uh, water deficits. Sure. I mean, it's a big problem. Lots of solutions will, will help solve it. Yeah. And actually, you know, for those of you, you know, I don't have a chance to meet all of you face to face, but usually I ask your, your interest and your background. 
I would say that it's a very exciting uh, career to pursue because there's going to be so many new opportunities. You know, we, when we talk about innovation, it's not just, you know, I gave you the example of water, but it's also uh, uh, plant development, mm -hmm. you know, cultivars, developing plants which are more drought resistant, yet maintain quality and quantity of a crop. Uh, you know, hybrids of hydroponic uh, cultivation, in fact, you know, you go to the stores, you can actually see butter lettuces, butter lettuce, pardon me, which is hydroponic grounds. Like mm -hmm, it still mm -hmm. it comes with a root, yeah. and, it, and its medium was was uh, water with nutrients that is being recycled and refiltered. So there's a, just a lot of new mm -hmm. opportunities that I think are very exciting. Yeah, definitely. But one other thing we you talk on before we go to the the vineyard is uh, the SIP. Sustainability and practice and the three E's of sustainability. Sure. We can talk about that before we head to the vineyard. Yes, absolutely. So going back 11 years ago, uh, a group of us looked at uh, how to uh, establish and, and formalize a little bit uh, a common approach to improving the, the long, longevity, the sustainability of, of vineyards because uh, at the time you really had two options, organic and organic tends to be more uh, herbicide, pesticide centric, not by choice but unfortunately because of regulation are very narrow as established, established by CDFA, these are the primary focuses although they're trying not to morph themselves to address in a more holistic way, you know, the farming practices. And the other one is uh, biodynamic certification. So those were the only two. So we found, well, what about the folks who try to be uh, a little bit more uh, progressive and how can we recognize their efforts? So, so sustainability actually if you look at the history, it comes from Switzerland. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of people try to take credit for it. Yeah. And certainly SIP should not take credit for it. Hmm. It started in Switzerland. And then uh, some Swiss immigrants, Italian Swiss immigrants came and then moved to the um, uh, Central Valley. And then some of them had brought some of these concepts called the Lodi Rule, hmm. which is another certification program. And everybody started circling the wagon sort of at the same time saying, hmm, there's something going there that we could benefit from. Hmm. So I would say that most of the, SIP uh, the, most of the sustainability models all follow the same three E's one being uh, the ecology, the second one being uh, social equity, and the third one, the economic part of the model. And yes, some of the terms may be you know, slightly interchanged, but it's pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. So if we take California, you have the Lodi rule. Another one is the collaboration between the Wine Institute and the California Grape Growers Association who have their own certification program. And then SIP, Sustainability and Practice, developed by the vineyard team. If you look at our neighbors in Oregon, they have what's called the uh, Greenleaf program. Mm -hmm. Very similar. Uh, Greenleaf program, in their case, looks at sustainability certification, organic, biodynamic, fish friendly, hmm. they call it the TILF, uh, and then the state allows a leaf in the back of a bottle, hmm. which is their concept of sustainability that encompass, you know, different approach. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Leonardo Academy which is an ANSI standard-making body, ANSI American National Standard Institute, 
developed a uh, American National Standard certification for sustainability in agriculture. Okay. That model applies to a broad range of agriculture, so it, it's not specific here to uh, grape growing as, as the different programs that, you know, that I illustrated a moment ago. Uh, but you know, I would encourage you folks to uh, Google uh, Leonardo Academy uh, ANSI uh, standard on um, agriculture. And uh, there is a wealth of information, uh, particularly in the section having uh, reference to various technical paper and academic papers. So uh, this effort started, I, I'm going to say at least eight, nine years ago. Uh, but it was a lot of heavy lifting because of all the different interests and entities, you know. I call it the herd of cats. Um, already if you take uh, wine, wine grape growers, viticulturists, you put them in a room, you're going to have different answers. Well, then you put someone who's growing corn, and, and somebody who's growing carrots, and somebody who's growing uh, wine grapes. Well, think. Yeah. Yeah, I got my own my own way of looking at things. You know, I have a I had a fellow who is a, a row crop grower, row crop in this case, lettuce, spinach, cilantro, etc. And uh, we, we had a conversation one day and said, well, you know, we're all farmers. He said, not you. He said, you guys, you know, about four or five months out of a year in winter months, you're just marketing. You're not doing any farming. Hmm. I looked at him and I said, you know, that's the kind of thing that a beer drinker would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't forget that. So, but... Funny. You know, we all look at things differently. Sure. Mm. So, the uh, ecology aspect for first E encompass water quantity, water quality. We touch base on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it includes uh, pesticide application, insects maintaining beneficial insects. It looks at soil health. In, uh, in California, we currently have a very big movement sp uh, supported by California Department of Food and Agriculture, CDFA, which is called the Healthy Soil Initiative. And it's trying to improve uh, the health of soil so that we do not have to be as dependent on fertilizers mm. application. The other aspect is to imp improving carbon in the soil. That's part of the Healthy Soil Initiative. And in this case, the car carbon in the soil has two, pardon me, three major benefits. One of them, carbon-rich soil improves the permeability of the soil. So when you have very heavy soil, clay, loamy soil, if you have a carbon-rich, it becomes more of a sponge, so it's going to retain the moisture better. The second benefit is when we're looking at water quality and the impact of uh, fertilizer, particularly nitrogen mm -hmm. and nitrates, uh, creating pollution of groundwater through infiltration. Carbon acts as a, a filter which delays the leaching out of the nitrates. And by slowing down the nitrates migration into the groundwater, it actually allows the plant to assimilate these nit nitrites much more effectively. Hmm. So that's another big one. And more recently, is the realization that as farmers, we can do a very good job in helping carbon sequestration because we can turn our land into a big carbon farm, so mm -hmm. to speak. And to illustrate that point, uh, I had one of my Cal Poly students, uh, that was three years ago, you know, I had him do his uh, graduation project in carbon sequestration, and we did a whole bunch of tests and pits looking at different areas on the property, 
in uh, what the impact the carbon content was hmm. so for instance I buy every year from Cal Poly about 150 tons of compost and uh, 150 to 200 tons it depends on the year so I've been doing this for 20 years mm -hmm. so you do the math uh, that's pretty significant so that's about an acre and a half pardon me a ton and a half per acre of compost times 20 mm -hmm. uh, and but we need to realize that compost uh, does not have its immediate effects you know and a lot of times oh you spread compost boom no the mineralization of a of the compost into carbon takes several years hmm. it can take hmm. as a minimum five to ten years oh wow particularly when you have droughts because you need that moisture mm -hmm. so so you're looking at long term solutions so in my case the mineralization is you know getting to manifest itself now so it it's kind of a wrong thinking that hey i'm gonna put a whole bunch of compost and i'm good to go it doesn't work that way now some other farms like the strawberry growers in the santa maria area I know some they will apply 10 to 15 tons per acre. Wow. Very sandy soil. Mm -hmm. That's to get as quickly as possible the nutrients mm -hmm. because you have that leaching. So that's a little bit different from, from here, you know, where I'm looking at more of the long range benefits. Mm -hmm. But back to the first E, soil health, you know, it's becoming extremely important and recognized. Plus, plants do need carbon and vines do need carbon mm -hmm. and all these little critters called microbes need carbon so you take carbon moisture and a little bit of oxygen and you have very happy microbial population mm -hmm. and that is all part of again that healthy soil initiative uh, another aspect is uh, wildlife uh, you know, bird habitat, fish habitat, uh, uh, wildlife corridor, which we do mm -hmm. with our riparian areas. There are also wildlife corridors, so we give a big buffer. So you have, uh, you know, we have cameras. We can see what's going on at night. And I mean, this this looked like, a, you know, one of the National Geography. Oh yeah, <laughs> is, oh look at this one. That's cool. <laughs> oh, we haven't seen that one before. Neat. You know. Neat. So. So that's the, the other aspect, uh, environmental and air quality. Mm -hmm. So the air quality is the type of pesticide application which have low, uh, low emission, mm -hmm. low vapor. And uh, in our case, for example, for uh, powdery mildew, we use canola oil and uh, sulfactum, which is basically a soap uh, that helps the ability to mix the oil with water mm -hmm. and also uh, it's applying these water-based oil over the, the grape leaves and the cluster to smother the, uh, uh, the mildew spores. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that technique but it's done in lieu of using wettable sulfur. You know, and sulfur certainly does can uh, manifests itself ultimately into the environment. Sure. And then same thing with certain type of pesticide applications. So the air quality is another important element, tying it also to fu fugitive dust control. So, you, you know, if uh, the wind is 10, 15 miles an hour, you're not going to start disking and creating the dust ball, you sure. know, going across the street to your neighbor. Sure, yeah. Next. And the other ones will be a little more abbreviated. Okay. Uh, is uh, social equity, and the social equity element is w realizing that as a farmer, you're not your own little island. Yes, you have a deed of trust says I own this thing. Place. Well, guess what? I'm just one little tiny place here in in hundreds of years mm -hmm. so we do have a social responsibility to recognize and realize that what we do here impacts the neighbors in the community so as such 
for example, it looks at if you have any complaints to the Air Commissioner from uh, noise, uh, fu fugitive dust, overspraying, um, you know, spraying when it's 15, 18 miles an hour winds and you have drift to the neighbors. Um, looking at your uh, experience modifier rate, OSHA log in terms of uh, accidents. It's looking at how do, do you engage with the community and pre-COVID-19, where, where almost every two weeks, in fact, for a while, I'm like, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> you know, I get my work to do, uh, doing tours for different uh, groups from the League of Women Voters to the mm -hmm. Master Gardeners and, and other classes for uh, Hancock as well and, and some other Cal Poly classes. So how you engage with, with a community to also help uh, expose people a little bit mm -hmm. about what farming is all about. I've done this for kids also. Mm. Uh, that's always interesting because a whole different set of questions. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, even some unusual classes I did with uh, Cal Poly and that was for the, um, uh, I forgot the name of the class, but it's religion, um, <laughs> It's a class on uh, the history of religion, and uh, and he's actually a, a non-denomination minister. Teach that at Cal Poly. So we've done that here with meditations and and uh, but you know, as a little side side issue, uh, wine has been deeply, deeply embedded sure. in in history and religions. Uh, from the Chinese to Israelis to the Greeks and the Romans, etc. Mm -hmm. So, so again, it's how you engage everyone, and then also how how do you treat your workers? Um, my full-time workers do get uh, uh, they do get uh, health care. Uh, we have H-2A visa. Uh, migrant workers where we have to provide housing and transportation in fact when you cross my bridge for a little house across hmm. that's where some of them live and then they bring the van here and work at my vineyard and some others because we basically set up a, a cooperative hmm. because i can't keep all of them busy a hundred percent so we share the cost and i usually like to remind that you know also that i have two sons so, All right, before the battery went dead there, you're going to talk about your, your slave labor you have? Yeah, slave labor, <laughs> exactly. Uh, my two sons, because, you know, they're exempt from uh, the uh, social equity. Uh, I, I have to remind that to everyone. But uh, we, you know, we do view also the, uh, you know, the, the work environment quality as being... Uh, very important and so uh, for example with our uh, agriculture workers you know we do provide them accommodations that are not quite the traditional way so you know they have they have desks they have refrigerator they have microwave oven um, I let them uh, sometime have their own barbecue I've had some of my workers ask permission to come and bring the, their kids camping hmm. uh, so they can see where dad works. Cool. Let them do that. Yeah. So it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Uh, when there's special special holidays or for, for their family, we get invited. Uh, so it, it, I think that's what social equity is all about. Yeah. You know? At one point in time, you're, you're saying you had some farming actually, some, some crops on your property yeah yeah for uh, I had some for a while where I let them farm a quarter of an acre mm. with irrigation and they were growing their own vegetables and and uh, I know some of it ended up at uh, a local farmers <laughs> market in Santa Maria but that was fine by me yeah yeah uh, and then uh, one time I was asked can we have chickens so I'm like yeah okay fine you can have chickens so they said, well, we got a little chicken coop we want to bring in the back. I said, that's fine. So the following week, my son, one of my son, Mark, says, 
Dad, there's a big flat bed here with this big thing coming. <laughs> Steve, th this was not a chicken coop. This was a condominium. Okay? <laughs> so we called it La Casa del Pollo. Uh, it was like multi-story with wow. chickens. Wow. But I make sure the number of roosters were under control. I didn't want to have any sure. little issues going on. How many chickens were in that? Oh, they probably had 40. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Yeah, wow. Quite an operation and then it created a bit of a problem with my wife because she wanted to have chickens. I said, we got enough to do here. I said, you go to farmer's market, you buy your eggs there, and you want brown eggs, you'll get that. I said, you realize the amount of work? And I was like, well, they can have all these chickens and I can't. So I talked a little bit to my workers. said, you know, if you bring a carton of egg once in a while to El Patron, yeah. <laughs> She's going to be happy. So. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's all, you know, part of what life is about, you know. It's yeah, not just great. the business, uh, which then segue to the business side, which is the last E, economic sustainability. You know, I think farming, particularly here in California, is under extreme pressures, economic pressures. And, and often regulatory pressures where we're not an easy state to do business, particularly in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're looking at also a very competitive environment with imports. Um, you know, if you're, if you're growing avocados as imports from uh, South America, well, you could look at the same with wine. I mean, how much import you go to the store, you look at the shelf. How many Pinot Grigios coming from Italy? Mm -hmm. I mean, millions of gallons. And wines from many, many other countries, which are very good at a very reasonable price. So international competition, you know, where a world economy uh, is, is a big problem. So when you have family-owned business, it, it also requires efforts to make it multi-generational because the challenges uh, uh, on uh, multi-generational are one, not always all family members are interested to be in farms. They yeah, don't want to do that. See, my dad worked his butt off. I'm not doing that. So that's one. And then also the, ch the challenges of passing on the farm, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, the statistics are pretty gloomy in California when you go first to second to third generation when you get to third generation you're down to i think it's eight percent of the farms mm -hmm. something like that and you also have the issues of inheritance tax uh that come into play mm -hmm. although right now that's being put to rest a bit with congress but we'll see if that lasts but i'm going to give you an illustration you know ultimately some some of you watching this video will go to Europe and some of you have perhaps already and uh, you go to Burgundy France and you look at the vineyard sizes in Burgundy or Bordeaux and say oh my goodness all these big names they're the postage stamp size mm. you know 125 acres in Bordeaux and Burgundy I'd be viewed as being a Rockefeller it's mm. like oh my god you know, there tend to be more 20 acres, 25 acres. Mm. Why is that? The inheritance tax. Because when you would, the, the family would, her, uh, her, you know, the inheritance, to pay the inheritance tax, which is 60%, you would have to sell part of a, part of a property to pay mm. for the taxes. And then on the next generation, the same. So if you take, out, a uh, hundred years, and you're looking at an average of three generations, that's exactly what took place. Mm. Uh, and that's why all these properties have been sliced and diced. Mm. And if you go to Alsace-Lorraine, same thing. And that's where the, pro the, the parcels also often are not contiguous. Is that there's a little bit here on the hill, a little bit across the village on that side and that side. Mm. It's because you were uh, you know, so and so is interest, but it's in in another section. Hmm. So, so having said that, economic sustainability. 
is also being able to have a balance be, between you know being environmentally driven but also being able to make a living because if you don't right. you will succumb to developers and you could be as green as you can as you can sure but that's not gonna uh, work so that requires then having a, a good budget an annual budget established that gets into a uh, good banking relationship, line of credit, uh, having uh, ha ha having uh, a long-term succession plan, and and uh, you know making sure that you know you don't try to buy a brand new super duper pickup truck every year just because you want the latest model. I simplify it, but <laughs> sure, you know, yeah, that's. That's a very important part. And we've got to remember that in California, 80% of the farms, I family farms, 80%. Good. And, uh, but it's sort of a David Goliath because uh, same thing with wine grapes where you have you know, a few large operations that make up the majority of the wines produced in California. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, within 80% of the family-owned farms, 80%, there is one of the direct dependents of a family, a family member who has what we call a day job. Mm -hmm. Meaning the wife is a teacher, the husband farms, or, or you know, one of one of the kids is a mechanic, and and but mm -hmm. it's not a hundred percent. Everyone being basically uh, making a living through the farm, mm -hmm. and I think that's a very interesting statistic when you when when you look at it. Yeah. And uh, this year, for example, with COVID nineteen and all the issues of the supply chain, chain, you know, very very challenging for for farmers. I know both your kids do work here at the winery. Do they do they want to take it over when you decide to call it quits? Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pr probably. You know, okay. uh, they're, uh, yeah. I think they all have, you know, found their niche, and I have basically placed them in in a good niche mm -hmm. where you don't have you don't have competition <laughs> for the same job. One is a uh, assistant winemaker, the other one is tasting tasting room and events manager, and it's complementing their skills. Cool. But you know, I remind them that uh, in my case, uh, retirement is overrated. <laughs> so, and uh, and also, uh, from an economic standpoint, uh, there is one thing called delegation versus abdication. You know, delegation you do with control, abdication, say, hey, you guys handle this, and I don't, you know, I don't want any feedback, and there's not a closed loop to see how we're doing. Mm -hmm. so, and, of course, in, in our case, which is a typical, you know, family-owned business, my wife, for example, has a CPA background, mm -hmm. which is very handy because she keeps my optimism under check. You know, when I say, hey, you know, I'd mm -hmm. like to buy this piece of equipment, so, uh, what's the ROI, you know, return on investment? I'm like, bummer, why did she have to ask that question? So, <laughs> but we complement each other. Perfect, yeah, that's a good That's a good system. All right, well, we ready to head down to the vineyard, you think? Ready, yeah. All right. Would you like, uh, you have water? I got some. Yeah, I've been, you know, I was quite concerned uh, with the heat and, you know, dehydration and, uh, you know, Pinot Noir particularly because Pinot is a s small berry grape, so it's a lot more susceptible to uh, dehydration. And uh, well, we're this year making a, uh, uh, a Pinot Noir based rosé, and uh, that requires lower bricks, usually in the 1920 bricks range and, and high acidity. We're also making a uh, pink uh, sparkling wine in French, uh, Champagne Rosé, and 
uh, also Pinot Bays and both of them do require an early harvest mm. so we uh, picked those uh, Tuesday last week 20 tons mm. night time uh, because I'm one of the first out of a shoot I was able to get enough of a crew uh, to make it happen okay because later in the season you know we're all after the same the same labor pool sure so uh, so I was glad to have that going how much earlier was your harvest this year compared to average uh, I've, I'll actually you know I think I'll be close to average uh, oh, okay. this is early because of the the type of uh, vinification that I'm pursuing okay you know I'm, I'm to make my regular still wine uh, Pinot Noir that's gonna be probably uh, second week of September oh, okay you know? okay but you gotta remember we had a pretty let's see we had a pretty cool uh, spring yes so yeah we did Okay. All right. So let's first talk a little bit about the soil. You know, I mentioned a healthy soil initiative, and so what I do here, every other row is disc. So you look at the row on the other side. It has been disked and then the same on my right. And then next year I'm going to switch where the disked row will look like this. So in these rows I put a cover crop and the cover crop is uh, winter snow peas, beans and wild oat. And uh, these, the peas for example, are nitrogen fixers and it's nitrogen fixer is there's too much nitrogen in the ground it'll take it in if there's not enough nitrogen it takes the nitrogen of the air and then metabolizes it so that's why it's uh, we call it nitrogen fixers and then what I do is uh, mow and you can see all the straw on the ground when I will disc this, what you're looking at here, this this is carbon. Mm -hmm. All right, this is all carbon. So we basically now will sequest the carbon in the soil, and uh, we'll have the benefit that I discussed a little bit earlier with you. But also, all of this dry matter is going to provide a little a little bit of um, uh, oxygenation and in, in, uh, uh, space within the soil structure because the straw is going to have its own little little spot so it's like thinking of a piece of Swiss cheese and you fill all the holes with straws and uh, so this is going to help also infiltration and although it may look dead you still have in the root systems you still have activity and so you still have um, uh, microbe activity that takes place and uh, with some of the little flowers that's still around of course this is the end of the season uh, you still have all you know beneficial insects activity so we'll switch this next year to the other rows and every year we make that change uh, when we put compost we band it at the foot of the vines and uh, uh, we also use every other year on these rows the Yolman plow or the key line plow which is an implement that was developed in uh, Australia uh, actually uh, to help the soil during extreme droughts and the the almond plow is a three shank chisel hmm. that goes about uh, 
two and a half, three feet in the ground, cracks open the ground at three points and then allows oxygen penetration. And when you have the first rains, the water goes deep in the ground. So this year, for example, when I do this pass uh, and we have say a good one and a half inch of rain, that water is already going three and a half feet in the ground, mm. right? If I didn't, it'll kind of stay in the surface and take a while to go deeper. Uh, initially, we, you can buy these implements in, in the United States. So what we did, we imported one from Australia mm. and set up the concept of a cooperative where we would mm. share the implement. Because mm. I mean, I, after four or five days, I'm done mm -hmm. and then it sits. Mm -hmm. So we shared it. So Yolman plow, a very important tool. Cal Poly uh, actually built Yolman plow for some uh, project that was done in uh, grants with the Resource Conservation District in uh, doing research on carbon sequestration. <laughs> and then the, the um, compost came from Cal Poly, so it, it was a, a grant-based project to perform some research and look at change in microbial activity and uh, uh, water infiltration in the soil and, uh, and also uh, how tall the grass would grow. Mm. So that's a little bit about uh, the soil here. Then let's move into the vines. These vines are uh, 40 plus years old. When I acquired the vineyard 20 years ago, I was suggested, oh, yank all those and put the new Dijon clowns. And I'm like, not only I'm not going to yank them, but I'm going to start dry farming them. So that's when everybody thought, this guy with a funny accent doesn't know what he's talking about. So, well, if you look today, I would suggest they're very much alive. So one of the things that we did is... Uh, Older vines have a disease called eutypa. A eutypa is, is also known as the dead arm disease. It's a pathogen which infects the, uh, the pruning cuttings and, and will constrict the capillary vessels of the vine. So the arm will die off just like a tourniquet and stop any sap flow through the arm and then will die off and in fact in some of my vines uh, you will see some of them have only one arm mm. instead of two would this one um, be almost that right here right to the right yeah yeah this would yeah. be a good example okay so this whole side gone so yeah, yeah, yeah. you see that here yeah so one of the technique is was to retrain and change from what's called spur pruning to cane pruning. Spur pruning is where you let, uh, that's what's happening on the blocks on across the road here. And you basically, just like a tree, let all the branches grow on the sides. Cane is to take the wood and train it to become new canes, like these, these are canes, okay? That were, that was wood from last year, and uh, I, I did an experimentation initially, and I was able to increase my crop production by 20%, mm -hmm. switching from spur to cane pruning. Because when you encourage cane pruning, it's always new wood versus the old wood that keeps giving your little fruiting shoot and, you know, and and so you lose quite a bit of your, your cell division capability. So this is a great way of extending the life of these guys. And uh, the other thing we do for your tapa, if you look, you see the white, the white here, it's called the b locks, which is a commercial uh, latex paint and boric acid. I could make it myself, but it's not legal because for me to do this, because I'm a commercial producer, so everything I use has to be CDFA mm -hmm. um, approved or USDA approved. So that what that does, it's basically 
to uh, seal and, uh, and prevent cross-contamination of a pathogen into the wood. So you can see here, this was one that, you know, we did cut. Mm. And uh, actually, this is a perfect example. You see this here? Mm -hmm. That's the infection of your typa. So when you have these brown marks, that's your typa. Otherwise, the wood would all be mm -hmm. nice and clean. So when you cut, you keep cutting until you no longer have these brown mm. areas. So this is a this is actually a very elegant example of of your tapa mm -hmm. taking place. Now it just cut off. Not not too long ago, actually. It looks like, huh? Yeah, I had them come back just two and a half, three weeks ago. Okay. The reason is I like to do it this time of the year because then you really can see where the infection takes place because early on you still have a little bit of struggling and you still have leaves but this time of a year mm. where you have utapa with the stress of the end of the year it's very very noticeable so I forgot to pick this but I have a big <laughs> pile okay. my burn pile in the back and then we load up and in fact long away some of them we cut it all the way down Hmm. And then I'm taking the, the, the new sucker to regrow uh, okay. and keep keep the roots. So same roots? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Now so would this would this still have the Utypa in it? Um, no. no. Well, you I mean the, the part you cut off, is that why you burn it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah you go down, cut and, and you still see Utypa, you keep going down, okay. down, down. Oh, okay. And then you you know, let's say you over here, it's clean, you take you take the new shoot, you retrain it, and within a year you have a crop. Okay. So. No kidding. Okay. Oh, yeah. That fast. Yeah. And so this this piece of wood we're seeing here is pretty clean, mm -hmm. right? This part. Right. Right here is very clean. So no utypa. Correct. All right. So then the other way to to combat utypa is uh, with a pruning shears at the end of a row dipping them in uh, chlorinated water to disinfect them and that helps mm -hmm. so this is one technique to fight uh, utypa and by the way utypa uh, is nothing new the romans had utypa mm. and you know the romans were very good in documenting their uh, winemaking and their uh, viticulture was in Latin, of course, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. uh, it was very detailed. And you look at the description of Utaipa, it's identical. Mm. So we know they already had Utaipa in those days. So this is not a, a new world disease. So then, uh, as I shared, this is a way of increasing production. You can see these are very, very healthy looking vines. When I talk about economic sustainability see this gives a smile to my face <laughs> they look nice yes so and we obviously put bird guards and because these are older vines uh, and they have quite a bit of foliage this is one way uh, for me to have bird control is to put these guys uh, which <clears throat> these will last eight years plus and then uh, on the top those little hats these were the the uh, pots used for replants that i buy mm. but it's just a perfect application that was that was mark's idea my son he said dad let's reuse those you know otherwise he pokes a hole through it i'm like dad why didn't i think about that protects the netting yeah exactly so the the other, the other aspect of having this cane pruning technique is uh, you're able to more effectively apply your spraying for powdery mildew. And because you have a little more uh, hygiene uh, developing the, with the wind flowing through and then the um, canola oil being able to penetrate. And you can see very clean fruit, mm -hmm. no, no powdery mildew at all so that's another 
another benefit of these canopy management and uh, then you know we do have look pest and one of them is the mealybug and we have three types of mealybug you have the obscure mealybug the vine mealybug and the long tail mealybug the obscure mealybug origins are coastal area and in fact this vineyard was ground zero of uh, research work done by uh, UC Berkeley entomology department in identifying a whole new type of mealybug that I never seen before, hence mm. the name Obscure. Obscure, it's obscure, huh? Yeah, well it's certainly nicer than call it the wolf mealybug, so... Um, <laughs> That's true. So we, we had vans coming of tours mm. to UC Berkeley showing the worst infestations <laughs> when I acquired the vineyard. I'm like, man, I, I don't want to yeah. be known for that. You yeah, know, yeah. that's when, you know, die is unknown and nuking the place was taking place. Uh, so I'm like, okay, there's got to be a better way. So we looked at, you know, mealybugs hide in the bark. Well, by switching to cane pruning, you take out the habitat canes don't have any bark even these guys here there's no bark okay mm -hmm. so the bark is actually now limited to the trunk and a little bit of the cordon arm maybe a foot foot and a half on each side so I reduce their habitat so they have no place to hide so that's one way to reduce the population but then you have a vector to the mealybug which is the Argentinian ant, uh, imported, you know, they came by sailboat. And the ants are attracted by the honeydew secretion of the mealybug, you know, the little sweet secretion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you have mealybugs, when you see a bunch of ants going up and down, and the ants will nurse the mealybugs uh, to make sure they have an ample supply of honeydew. So we did some trials and uh, initially we developed some uh, ant traps homemade with uh, Clorox bottles, empty Clorox bottle. We put a little uh, mason jar in and a fine little trellising wire mesh that was a ladder for the ants to go in the jar. And then we had a sugared water with boric acid and the idea is to take the poison back to the colony and ideally kill the, the queen and the nursery. Well, you know, I was doing uh, some research called uh, the BIFS program, Mouthful, Biologically Integrated Farming System, you know, BIFS. Uh, it came with that name. I said, that sounds like a beef jerky name, you know, beef. Oh, you got BIFS? So, uh, you know, I was using Cal Poly students as the uh, scouts, you know, f uh, to count the ants. And as you know, students will do a lot for credit units. So I had an ample supply of labor. And uh, we were doing this, you know, as, a, as an interesting research project. So initially, uh, we had too much boric acid in, in the sugared water. And the sugared water was about 30 bricks to simulate the sweetness of a honeydew. Well, the ants would die before going back to the colony, so mm. that didn't work. So then we throttled back, but then we didn't have enough boric acid to offset the uh, native yeast that caused spontaneous fermentation. So I was making cheap mead, you know. And drunk ants. Yeah, so the <laughs> ants would get drunk. They wouldn't remember how to get back to the colony. So I was like, okay, that didn't work. Uh, you know, learn by doing. <laughs> so then we finally get it right. And, you know, applied research is, there's not a, a recipe, you know, so you, tr you do trials. Mm -hmm. So we finally got it right. And actually these kind of, in, in a much more elegant packaging, these are now commercialized. And one of the brand name is Gourmet. But, you know, I don't do these to get patents. It's just, hey, you can do the research and if it works, great for everyone so that's a, that has been very successful in reducing the ant population 
and we look where we see ants and then we will put one of those traps in a well-positioned trap will kill about a million ants. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, one, one healthy colony will have a million ants. So mm. when years ago I had a lot of mealybugs and in the winery, you know, we would have to toss quite a few clusters that were infected because I didn't discuss the negative, but um, two things can happen. The honeydew secretion is an irritant to the, the plant tissue and it can cause a decline of vine production because of these honeydew coating it, mm -hmm. which is then, as it dries up, it's almost like a charcoal looking material. And then also the, the mealybugs will uh, nest in the clusters and it can impart a bitter flavor to the mm -hmm. wine. Hmm. And uh, wineries don't like getting closer with a whole bunch of crawling things in it. Mm -hmm. So that's a no-no and you can be subject to rejection of your grapes because of uh, the exceedance of foreign material. So that's when what, you know, two of the big problem is the plant growth and the quality of the grapes. So then another way to uh, trick these mealybugs is uh, the use of a um, uh, mating disruptor. So this mm. here, this is a pheromone card. Mm. And a pheromone card, this has been impregnated with a sensitized female pheromone of mealybugs. Mm. So where you know you have mealybugs, you look for ants, you see ants and then you hook this on the wire or on the cane and then during the mating season the, the males will be attracted by these little cards and obviously get confused <laughs> miss the mating cycle and you collapse the population doing that now i never did care having those darn thing all over the place pieces of plastic and I tell my workers, okay, after harvest, when you see them, you pick them up. That doesn't happen. So what we're doing now is actually a little more effective. We're using a pheromone spray. Hmm. And uh, we're not the whole vineyard, you know. Mealybug infestations are localized. And I'll explain why in a moment. But where we know we have mealybugs, we'll actually we'll spray that area with this uh, pheromone uh, mating disruptor. And then the males, because this is broadcast, are totally confused. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this is very effective. It's organic. Okay, so th this, this is not playing Frankenstein, you know, where all of a sudden right. you're going to have, uh, you know, 12 legged <laughs> mealybugs. Uh, with two heads uh, so we we've been replacing uh, the treatment this way <laughs> and uh, the reason it's more zone based is because the culprits that move around the mealybugs are the birds <laughs> birds go on the leaves and then the mealybugs get go into the feathers and they're transported in different uh, okay. locations. Huh. So to control the population is very challenging because there's not an invisible fence around here and you know, a sign saying millibucks prohibited at Wolf Vineyard that can come from my neighbor. Sure, sure. So that's one of the methods of transmission. Mm -hmm. So that a little bit about uh, the treatment and then the other one we use is uh, the release of beneficial insect which is the uh, a stingless wasp and uh, the stingless wasp it's also a, they're reared also at uh, UC Berkeley entomology department the wasp lay their eggs on the mealybug egg mass and uh, the mealybug egg mass have a faster gestation period so the larva of the wasp will eat the mealybug eggs and basically also kill that cycle. So mm -hmm. that's effective. 
and also reason therefore you want to have insect area to keep these wasp on the property and not going you know taking off somewhere else and as I said they're stingless so that's a good thing mm -hmm. like, like mm -hmm. customers like that too <laughs> uh, so that's a, what I shared with you is IPM integrated pest management this is a perfect example back I'd say kind of textbook example of IPM where you're not using harsh chemicals but you're using different techniques you know bio solutions uh, to reduce insects disease you know pests mm -hmm. And it's not always one solution, it's multiple. Absolutely. There's yeah. no silver bullet in, in, in this business. And also, there's no overnight solution. You do one thing like composting and you expect, boom, that's it. I'm done. Next year, I'll have 10% uh, more crop. No, take your time. So, so yeah, the, the impacts, you know, take up many, many years. I would say going from the worst, uh, uh, the, the worst cases of mealybug infestation that we had to get the population under control was a five-year process. Wow, no kidding. Yeah, little baby steps of improvements. Yeah. yeah, but obviously before when they were nuking the place, that wasn't solving the problem either, correct? No, because you killed all the beneficials. So then, you know, and mealybugs move around through the birds and I said well we're gonna come back in revenge here and uh, we're really gonna show well vineyards what this is all about so uh, the other issue too is that we we did we, if you look at all the hills that's all new planting okay this is the original vineyard so that's about 55 plus acres of new planting so when I got the plants, they were in green pots. And guess what? There were uh, mealybugs in green pots. Mm. The, the dirt, the soil was contaminated. Wow. So we ended up with the vine mealybugs there, not the obscure. So it started all over again. And uh, sort of a little uh, dark secret of nurseries in those days. You know, the, mm. the quality control wasn't quite there. And so a lot of us got infected in uh, planting brand new vines mm. through the green pots. That's a bummer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's walk yeah. through a couple of uh, research projects. So she's got a couple more weeks to harvest a Chardonnay here? Uh, Chardonnay next month. Next month? Uh, I, I would okay. say. Well, when I say next month, it's going to be end of September. End of September. Yeah. Okay. So a little more than a month. Oh, yeah. And it's good. You know, you want to have long fruit hanging time. So you pick a lot of nutrients. Um, you see this? Well, let's see. One, two, three. You see the third one? Mm -hmm. where there's a little shoot. That's where you cut it way down. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then that's the way to salvage them. Okay. And you have a little gap here where you come in and, and plant another one here in the gap too at some point? Yep. 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 But this year I, I did a, about uh, 800 inner plants. Oh, wow. Okay. So a little at a time. I focused on that section of inner plants. That's the Pinot up this direction? Uh, Pinot, Pinot over there. Okay. This is all Chardonnay. Ah, uh, still Chardonnay. Uh, this is all spur pruned, not cane pruned. And, uh, you know, one of the issues of the severe droughts that we had is that the vines really suffered from uh, lack of water mm -hmm. and uh, salt buildup. Because even they have a deep root system, there's only so much. So, you know, these 40, 45 year old vines really declined. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the reason why 
I'm already starting a replant program and there is a part that is follow the back there mm -hmm. I removed uh, vines that were not productive it's part of economic sustainability you know look at my farming cost if I get a half a ton to your acre it doesn't pencil out so okay so followed that and progressively doing some replant and I'll show you the technique we're using before that we'll stop here and uh, this weather station is a bio meteorological research project that I'm doing in collaboration with UC Cooperative and uh, part of climate change and climate adaptation this takes various various key measurements uh, one of them of course rain gauge and this will give you daily hourly cumulative uh, year to date uh, wind wind speed wind gust wind direction temperature at five feet and all the way on top exactly 30 feet temperature and uh, we are measuring temperature at 30 and 5 feet to measure inversion layer and w again with some of the climate change we find in the winter pardon me in early spring often the air is frozen above and so if you fire up your wind machine you make things worse you just take frozen air you bring it down and you really toast them kill everything mm. so that has happened many times so this will monitor the inversion layer and also when you're spraying if you have a strong inversion it can actually cause uh, a spray drift you know think about mm -hmm. pressurizing pushing things down and it pushes it on the side so that's interesting research being done right now mm. so we look at both we're also monitoring with the guy above where and here we have uh, solar radiation watts per square meter mm. we're measuring re uh, relative humidity we're measuring dew point we calculate through the software uh, we calculate uh, mildew pressure we calculate uh, ET evapotranspiration and uh, this is updated every 15 minutes and actually hmm. let's see if we can do this <laughs> well, well I'll look for a shadow and this is also going to the university for somebody to monitor there oh you you have i'm one of several stations now okay and it's public access online oh. so my vineyard management company can access it i can be uh i, I can be somewhere on the beach <laughs> in uh having a, a cold brewski and uh, see what's going on at 12 vineyards so let's see here we go okay okay so we go here this these are all the stations okay right now our temperature is 79.9 degrees <laughs> well I, i'm not gonna let that stop me we we'll go here orchard road okay slow 14 temperature five feet um temperature at 30 feet so the inversion yeah. the temperature difference one degree is those? one one point eight huh. uh, heat index relative humidity dew point wind speed wind gust solar radiation huh. daily minimum daily maximum and then there's a whole bunch of additional ones neat with all these other data so can do it this way can do it online and this is part of precision farming when i mentioned uh, adaptation you know the old method of saying well today is wednesday so it's time to irrigate or or apply uh, powdery mildew uh, spraying 
you need to adapt and look at the real data. Mm -hmm. So now we're able to uh, be a little smarter on how we apply our spraying and uh, looking also at uh, ET for irrigation. And the next sensor I'm going to put will be that way will be a real-time live soil moisture sensor using uh, TDR technology, time domain reflectometry hmm. at three different depths. And there it doesn't look at uh, moisture at a single point, but the volumetric uh, estimation of how much moisture there is in the soil, which is a big difference. Sure. So hmm. we'll be able to look at, you know, effect of rain, uh, on, on the soil and also irrigation and then all these there will be a sensor over there there will be a sensor all the way on top of the hill and there's going to be a sensor on one of those hills there three different soil types mm. and they're all going to be Wi-Fi connected to this guy mm. and then in addition then you will see uh, a location A, location B, location C, and then I can even then further fine-tune irrigation based on the elevation. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this, this is uh, pretty exciting because uh, uh, John Lindsay is also, you know, a local meteorologist is going to use this <laughs> where, you know, Bragnay doesn't have data point for the Inner Valley. <laughs> you know, it'll say Avila so much Pismo and you know being being a scientific weather station it'll help and one of the things I was a little frustrated is that you know there's a semi station at Cal Poly but it's like bureaucracy to put one of those where you have to put grass you have to put a fence oh, really? around and all kinds of do's and don'ts I'm like I don't have time for that <laughs> so <laughs> I told our local farm advisor, I'll pay for the darn thing. Let's let's move on here. Sure. And he said, cool. So I said, you, we, let's put it. And also, you know, I'm going to put a little sign here acknowledging their research work. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is another good example of collaborative work, you know, with with universities and uh, research projects. You know, this thing. Yeah, very cool. So then. Let's go on the other side. Uh, these vines I planted uh, three years ago, and the typical planting uh, of vines is that those, those pots that you see, that's the root, okay? And then you make a little shallow hole and then you sink them in the ground. So <clears throat> there's a new type of vines being uh, sold in nursery and they're called uh, sometime some of the brain is uber vine or tall vine and it basically is the root stock is three feet long and you take out the laterals and only use the root ball at the bottom so those guys will come already three and a half feet tall Wow! and the grafting is just the last bit like this so what I do though I make a three foot deep hole with an aug with a auger and I sink them below ground and this is the Sion you know the grafting that's the graft joint the graft joint three feet down is the root mm. and then this is uh, Chardonnay mm -hmm. Uh, winty clone okay and so these guys being planted deep in the ground already have quite a bit of moisture and uh, and then the type of rootstock I use is the 1103 P which is a drought resistant rootstock mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, the root tends to be more of a carrot going deeper mm -hmm. with very little lateral uh, and high salt tolerance mm -hmm. and what we talked about earlier right so then the other thing I do at the same time I make that hole uh, I put this pipe schedule 40 and uh, 
with a little cap, button emitter, and I deliver the water directly three feet below ground in this pipe. And at the bottom I cut a little slit to allow water dispersing. And so the, the irrigation is three feet below ground. Mm. So the net result is that, you know, when you look at vines, you have two major water loss in ET, evapotranspiration, you have evaporation, which is when you irrigate above ground, mm -hmm. the wind, the solar radiation, uh, up, you know, 50% plus goes up in the air. And then transpiration is basically the vine itself losing right. moisture, you know, through its dehydration. The wind, the sun does that. When it's extremely hot, they will perspire more. So you have mm -hmm. higher transpiration. So in the model, I basically eliminate evaporation doing this. And every single vine has one amateur. These guys get watered at 50% of all those guys. Wow. And I get the same crop. So the other thing I did is use the pressure bomb, which is the vacuum chamber last year. And we did the test at midday. And uh, usually you measure uh, uh, you moisture stress in high stress, medium stress, low stress, no stress. None of them showed any stress. They were all no stress. Hmm at 50% and we did the test in August. That's cool. So you can see, you know, a pretty good, pretty good crop. And you know, the vine still being young, you, little, you have a little bit of differentiation, sometime one vine to the other, and that tends over the years to, to become a little more uniform. But you know, you look like a cross and over here, these guys probably, uh, I'm gonna say I get three tons plus to the acre. Hmm. Not bad for a third year. Awesome. Tighter spacing. So our, you know, the old vines are 12 foot wide rows, eight feet apart. These are nine foot wide row, five feet apart. Hmm. And I use that because all my other planting is nine foot two. And on the hills, I did not want eight feet because eight feet and you get a tractor and a trailer, you have zero room for mistake. You know, all of a sudden you, you think mm -hmm. of something, mm -hmm. boom, you'll hit. Or you slip, you know, sure. with green grass in the, the springtime and spring. So safety wise, I wanted to give a little bit of extra room. So I standardized my vineyard. All new planting is nine foot space, five foot wide. I don't believe in high density. You know, you go to Napa or Sonoma, not to pick on them, but uh, <laughs> you, uh, you know, say, well, why the tight spacing? Oh, this is to help the vines compete a little bit more with each other. And that way, you, you know, it really helps the quality of the fruit. You translate that uh, marketing puffery in plain English, it's plain economics. You pay too darn much for the land sure. and you got to yeah. try to get as big of a crop as you can. Sure. It has nothing to do with competition. You can achieve competition with pruning. Easy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and shoot finning. So it's no, no big issue. One thing too I want to point out is that I have a little bit more shade that I leave. Part of my climate change adaptation is you look at some of the vineyards, they strip everything. It's bare clusters. In fact, you can go to areas in Paso. Mm. Then you get a heat wave and guess what? Sunburn. Mm. I mean, you beat the heck out of your, your plants. And is that just so, kind of the discoloring you see a little bit here? Is that a little bit of sunburn on there? Yeah, or? yeah that's yeah. exactly what it is. But, you know, in my case, of course, you want a little bit of exposure, okay? Otherwise, these guys are going to ripen at Christmas. So I don't want that. Okay. Uh, so, you know, they, these, compared to more conventional, I have a lot more shade uh, coverage, you know, with leaves over them. 
and uh, that helped reduce uh, the the sunburn. I, you know, three years ago, in my Pinot, I mean, they were stripping everything, um, and then we got big heat wave. I'm like, oh my God, I had raisining. I'm like, mm. I keep up on doing this. I'm gonna sell my Pinot in little California raisin boxes, you know. <laughs> so that's the change to make and so i've trained everyone to work on my vineyard i want tunneling which is another little different technique on the pinot which is built like a little tunnel mm. you know, canopy okay to give a little extra shade and then it's asymmetrical because the area where you have more sun there's more leaves left the area where you have the opposite side we're a little more aggressive in leafing okay so then I'll show you two other stages. So I have six rows with the pipes, and then I have five rows without. So these are also three feet deep. Uh, 1103p but with a surface emitter mm -hmm. so this year is the last year of my trial where i'm going to take five rows five rows and do a ton per acre comparison and see the difference in crop production where you your below ground irrigation versus above ground irrigation and you should have a difference because these guys don't have more wa water uh, at the roots than those guys. So the other thing we did is uh, we did at the end of the row I dug some vines and uh, I, I have pictures of them. It's just lovely. Mm. Uh, the roots are already an extra foot and a half. So those guys are already four and a half feet below ground. Mm big long alligator root so you give them another year you know next year they'll be five feet five and a half during normal years i won't have to water them hmm. i may based on you know what my soil moisture sensors will tell me give them maybe a little water in, in august but mm -hmm. all the way through august they'll be on their own wow that's awesome so so is this something where you can actually like publish a paper comparing yeah, this to oh, okay yeah i'm gonna put a white paper okay. i was i was offered grants i said no i don't want to oh you know I, i'm not going to use taxpayers money for this uh i was suggested to patent my what is to pack schedule 40 <laughs> half inch drilling a hole you know and my son and my previous Cal Poly student you know, worked on the chop saw making all the pieces and uh, I've also way in the back did some replant and I'll explain that in a second and I did the same thing so all my new planting is this way in fact okay. if we go here you'll have a good illustration These so this is this is three years old here this is three years old okay this was planted last year oh okay and that was planted this year oh okay so every single one you know i switched to mm -hmm. to the pipe the only ones i haven't yet are those guys but i will retrofit them again because i wanted to do more of a long-term experimentation to see what how i can compare and contrast the two probably will get fancier to doing a qualitative analysis because I mean it's one thing to take tons per acre uh, I'm gonna do also a comparison of uh, looking at um, cluster count and cluster weight and then and then I think I'm, I'll be set mm -hmm. so cool yeah so now I have um, I have about, there's about 7,000 vines. Wow. And uh, that adds up quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, except for these five rows, they all have the pipes 
and uh, <clears throat> you know increasingly these guys are the older vines are succumbing to disease so I'm doing gradual replacement you know if I had a, a big bank account uh, I say oh, I'm just gonna rip and replace everything I don't want to do that because then I lose production too so I'm doing it two acres at a time mm -hmm. so these guys come up to speed now because they produce more than those it offset floss mm -hmm. and also in terms of production and also contracts that I have where customers have been buying fruit from me for 20 years I all of a sudden it's not like well what happened no no wolf in your program mm -hmm. so um, it's part of the economic sustainability of the model sure Sorry. yeah well, that's all uh, uh, ground squirrel activity huh yeah <laughs> Jeez. but you know very little topsoil right makes it uh, drain a little better with a lot of the yeah, rocks and stuff in there only if the soil is well well prepared and there's a section back there where the, the ground was not deep ripped adequately so uh, and it's the wrong rootstock so those guys will for an ever, ever and ever struggle so mm. one of those things I could have I should have yeah yeah and if I could wind back to 20 years ago there's definitely quite a few things I would do differently yeah one of them okay <laughs> is 15 years ago I planted Petit Sirah and uh, all of a sudden I get red leaves and a major decline in fruit production and also the vines themselves so I did the test and they're all infected with uh, uh, you know viral infections which is the uh, red blotch and uh, red leaves now uh, there is what's called protocol 2010 which is certified wood and it's called protocol 2010 because in 2010 was the development of DNA to identify viral infections yeah. down to the plant tissue level so you can have a viral free certified wood DNA tested. Hmm. So, but that was in 2010, I planted it five years before that. So I'm not the only one, many, many of us, particularly with Syrahs and Petites, hmm. uh, have that issue. So I'm doing a replant with a 2010 protocol, phylloxera resistant, 101 14 and those tall vines okay. so i'm stacking the deck with all the latest research available and i fought with some of the plants we plant them about at the same time as these guys and then it was a couple that had a couple of head red leaves i'd say oh no my god so took them to a lab and said no no virus free Good. to show advancements of technology that it cost me sixty dollar a test. Wow! Wow! If I tried cool. to do that five years ago, one thousand two hundred dollars. Wow! Wow! So we we're just making tremendous progress. Yeah. You know, in in uh, lab testing and and some of our abilities to trace because not only we can tell the virus, but we, you know, you can compare and say it, it's virus number XYZ so you go in the database and yeah. you know what kind of virus it is huh. so uh, interesting yeah so that's part of a progress so I I did that replant and, uh, and that's all the are behi behind the windmill back up there correct. okay yeah that is correct so there is uh, exactly 2,000 vines back there wow replanted and in front of that is, is your pond, right? It's been yeah, awesome to be yeah, back that's there. That's where the, the little refuge is located. It's pretty low, you know. Last year, this last year, our rainfall was at about 72% of annual. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this year is not going to be a repeat. I know. All right. And then these guys are 
just you know if a pot is in the ground okay but what you imagine now is that all this is below ground huh now the idea is that next year you'll have another one of these mm -hmm. and then this become your your cordon okay but yeah that's a good example of what it actually looks like so one of the one of the questions we had from the students was from uh, Kea and uh, she asked uh, apart from using organic soils and resources are wolf wines certified organic uh, all right Kayla the answer is no we are certified uh, sustainable and uh, I had toyed the idea of becoming uh, organic certified but a lot of the research projects that I'm doing some of which I've described to you would nullify my organic certification if you deviate from the requirements uh, you know there were some other trials that I had done here and uh, so because of that I, I don't want to be certified organic also organic certification by itself is not as holistic you know you need to address water quantity uh, you need to address address wildlife corridor etc I'm not suggesting that organic growers are not good steward of the land I'm not suggesting that at all but embedded in the certification you know it doesn't manifest itself mm -hmm. so that's why I was attracted by the sustainability certification but uh, in conclusion to your question um, we do apply a lot of organic principles for example our um, one of our liquid fertilizer is uh, compost tea of uh, seaweed hmm. so it's uh, algae uh, compost tea that is with pH adjusted and filtered and that's 100% organic. That's very cool. All right, uh, Amber asks, uh, in regards to your section about air on your ecology page, please expand on your extensive recycling program. More specifically, how does it effectively contribute to reducing carbon emissions? Okay, uh, so thank you for that question. One of the uh, aspects that we use, for example, is the uh, uh, the diesel we use for our tractors is uh, biodiesel. Mm. So we use the 80 20 mix. Our uh, little uh, 4x4 mule, Kawasaki mule, is also uh, biodiesel. Even our uh, uh, pressure washer steamer is uh, biodiesel. And then, uh, depending sometime on the batch, you know, it smells like you're behind the exhaust fan of McDonald's. You know, yeah. Smell, you have french fries here. You know? Makes you hungry, I bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, one of the, the examples that I showed about uh, cutting back my irrigation by 50%, mm -hmm. that directly translates to reducing carbon emission. Why? Uh, because CO2 emission. Why? Because I use half the water. My pump uh, electric use is reduced in half in terms of kilowatt hours. It takes uh, a certain amount of carbon based resource to produce electricity. So you do reduce uh, your, your carbon emission. All the way to our wine bottles, for example, you look at the wine glass we have, it's, it's fairly lightweight. Now you have some wineries where you take the bottle, it's like dumbbells, it's like, I could use this for exercise. Well, that's to make you believe that it's high quality wine and that helped justify why you pay $80 for the bottle where you can get a, a bottle here at $32. So the carbon footprint for the glass is significant. These bottles weigh two pounds each, empty. So that's, that's a carbon footprint. Uh, we were one of the first wineries here to use, uh, uh, to stop using styrofoam for uh, shipping containers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones we use are made from recycled cardboards. 
So, you know, a lot of these examples down to our dishwasher at the tasting room is a is a two cycle yeah. where the rinse like, cycle goes in a reservoir and, and gets I'm used for the first cycle yeah, on the next hmm. batch. Hmm. So you basically <laughs> reuse that water twice. Yeah. yeah. And still meet all the sanitation requirement. Yeah. So so yes, you, you know you you can make a significant impact. Also variable frequency drive. So we our pumps we can control the speed of the pump by monitoring how much water is needed and the amount of pressure needed. Mm. And that improves the efficiency of, uh, you can improve the efficiency about 15% plus doing this uh, with controlling the speed because then you have the exact amount of horsepower matching the uh, required energy to push for water through the irrigation so, system. Okay, cool. Uh, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but uh, actually, I has a question about how long do you think it'll take you to replant your drought-resistant rootstock? Okay, Ashley, it's uh, in my case three years. Okay. Uh, and uh, I have a, f a good crop within three years. Okay. I would say this year probably I'll achieve 75% of a full crop. And then by fourth leaf next year, 100%. Oh, okay. Uh, now, typically, that's what it takes. It's, it's a third leaf to get your first crop. Now, the vines that we just looked at uh, between the row as we came to the tasting room and I showed you where you have the wax material. Yes. And, you, and actually, you'll see that on the video. Uh, those, you can get a crop already in two years. Oh. But that was the whole idea of designing these plants is that you already had your, your trunk on the first year mm. and second year you have laterals and you get a crop mm. so that's to shave one year off but in my case i sacrifice one year uh, for the benefit of being able to s reduce the water use uh, in combination with my subsurface drip system because my subsurface drip system would not work as effectively if yeah, I didn't put those fish, roots like, three yeah, feet below ground. Um, she a, she Very cool. That, like, uh, this might be too specific a question, but uh, Marina asked, how many oh, gallons of water? Who, who asked? Uh, Marina. 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 Is this a trick question? I don't know. It's really specific though, but you might have the info. Uh, how many gallons of water is used to water one acre? And do you water every day? I'll pause for the airplane to go by. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll restate the question, maybe you can hear on the video. Uh, how many gallons of water is used to water one acre, and do they water plants every day? All right, I can answer that question. Uh, the watering is uh, every two weeks, and it's about four hours per plant. Okay. And the button emitters that you saw is 0.48 gallon per hour. So you take 0.48, let's run it off, yeah, half yep, a gallon yep. times four, two gallons. Two gallons so per plant. Per plant every two weeks. Okay. Now, that's half of what conventionally you would water. And actually half of what I do, but if I take my neighbors, it's more than that. Hmm. ET, evapotranspiration. Yeah. The model that I use, my irrigation is at about that 60% of evapotranspiration. So I replace only 60% of the transpiration and evaporation. My, you know, when we were looking at on my cell phone, mm -hmm. the ideal ET right now was uh, uh, 76% hmm. okay. in the last half hour. So I'm watering below ET. Okay. So I give you the precise gallons per vine. And uh, your math exercise is <laughs> that uh, in that nine by five spacing is 780 vines. 
So you do 780 times, right. Right. 0.45, so that tells you per hour how much water. Okay. And, uh, and that, you know, when you do the map, you say, well, that's a lot of water, but it's, it's about half of what, what is typically used in vineyards. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, this, this is kind of a, a long question slash comment, but I think she has some direct tie-in with this living up in Paso Robles. Uh, this is this is Keandra, and she asked, "What made Wolf uh, push for sustainability for his winery?" I feel like around here, wineries typically seem to seek out profit profit first rather than seeking out sustainability. When I lived in Creston, the wineries in Paso had tried to drain our personal water from our wells as well as our neighbors. Even though I read about these same wineries took a large majority of the city's water, I understand that sustainability is important for many reasons, and that alone makes sense to why Wolf took this path. However, a winery pursuing this seems bizarre to me, and I wanted to know exactly why he went this route 10 years ago. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a little different on how I think, uh, and uh, I, I always felt that I needed to look at the long-term uh, survivability, a different word for sustainability, uh, and I could see clearly with the droughts that uh, I could not take the water for granted. Also, where I'm located here in the aquifer, I'm on a shallow side of the aquifer, so this is called riparian. And uh, so I don't have wells like some of your neighbors in Paso where they get 200, you know, if it doesn't produce 200 gallon a minute, they say, oh my God, this is just a little drip. Mm. Uh, me 200 gallon, I, I don't know how to count that far. Uh, you know, my wells at best, you know, maybe 180, and that's on an ideal year. But I have 25 gallon a minute, 20 gallon, and they're all series connected. So I realized I need to be very frugal with my water use. And I could see with the droughts how the the uh, the, sta the static level of the water will keep on dropping every month. You know, I, mu I measured the every single well that I have, uh, the depth of the well, and I can give you my records back to 20 years. It all goes in a logbook, and I have water meter on every single well, so I know exactly how much water also was used so every month I also measure on every single well my water use for the month mm -hmm. so I'm pretty analytic about this and that basically compelled me to say wow I gotta watch this what you don't measure you cannot manage and uh, so that I, you know it's a little bit of my scientific background and I said well I'm a little different well, the example was digressing slightly from water. My Petit Syrah. I'm the first commercial grower to produce a cool climate Petit Syrah on the central coast. All the Petit grown are in warm areas typically. You know, immigrants who came to California, that's where they were planting in warm areas. So I had planted seven acres of Petit Syrah. Of course, unbeknownst to me, some of them were viral infected mm -hmm. that had to be planted. But nevertheless, I planted that. I had a neighbor who came to me, so you're planting petit sourage up here, it'll never ripen. So what have you been smoking? And you know, this is be before cannabis became legal. <laughs> so I told him, I said, you know what? I never inhale and I know my French geography. So that was my answer to him. He kind of was a little set back by my answer, but ultimately it worked. And, uh, my petite fourth year received uh, triple gold at the Orange County Commercial Competition. They never did that before, mm. giving three medals. And our petite about four four years ago was voted best red wine in, in California. Mm. So, yeah, maybe I'm a little different, but, uh, you know, once in a while you, 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 you have... 
Be careful listening to experts. People who call themselves experts means they haven't learned enough. <laughs> so so you, you you need to also make your make your own decisions. And then back to your point about why do I why I took this approach is is that you know, I have a deep commitment for the, the environment and respect for the environment. Uh, and my wife and I, you know, in fact, yesterday, over a, a nice glass of rosé, we're commenting on that. We were hearing the quails all around the garden. I say, you know, it's nice what we have done, you know, here in, in, in maintaining and improving the environment. And it's got to come from the heart, mm -hmm. you know. If it comes from the pocketbook, and, and and being green is a greenwash, it's strictly a marketing tool. Eventually, that shows. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually that shows. So you so you got to be true to yourself, and uh, and we have been rewarded by that. And I'm glad you asked that question, because when we when the economy took quite a dive. Mm -hmm. Where people say, oh, you know, we, my husband or wife lost the job or reduced ours, and we were members of three wine clubs. Well, we're keeping one because we we believe in wolf and what you do, mm -hmm. both environmentally but also as a family business. So, wine is discretionary income, and people vote with their wallet. So. I have felt that there is that connection and recognition, mm -hmm. and uh, we we've seen this this year, 2020, with COVID-19, and we certainly saw the same thing when we had, you know, the the economy uh, because of a subprime market that caused the market to tank, and people saw their 401k melt like an iceberg in Antarctica, so. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but thank you for asking that. Yeah, and this this is maybe a good tie-in too. You know what? What are uh, Kelly asked? Uh, what are some issues or problems that a sustainable winery would have that a typical winery would not have? Well, Kelly, one <clears throat> one is the the uh, production cost because um, if you use sometimes conventional farming, uh, your cost per acre can be a little lower. <clears throat> and also your tendency of increasing crop load production, meaning, you know, not being content, say, with an average of four ton per acre, but say, hey, I want to get six tons per acre. Six tons per acre means more fertilizer, more intense farming, more tractor pass, you know, more manipulation, and, and so... Uh, environmentally, you know, you have certain consequences, but you do have a, a higher income generated. And, uh, you know, that's why in some of the big corporate farming, I mean, it's all about production, production, production. Sure. And uh, so that's the dichotomy between, between the two. And there's been a lot of studies down on whether or not people were willing to pay a premium for uh, sustainably produced or certified wines. And you know, the answer is, well, if you take a bottle of certified versus non-certified, we'll, we'll take the certified, but particularly during difficult economic time, people are not willing to pay a certain premium price. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fact. Uh, I was involved with a study done at um, uh, Princeton University a few years ago, and they did a lot of consumer focus groups and etc. And basically, yeah, uh, on average, people will say, yeah, well, yeah, we like the sustainable. By the way, organic, not so much because organic there's still issues of concern about preservation of the wine mm -hmm. because of the, uh, the lack of uh, metabisulfite addition for example 
So the shelf life of organic wines often is a little shorter. What is changing though is the younger generation is looking more favorably at, at sustainable mm -hmm. uh, certified wines. So that that's that's a change that's taking place. Yeah. Well, this I guess is a great follow-up question. This is from from Taylor Tobin. He said, uh, "What would you say have been the financial costs of a more sustainable vineyard? Can you disprove the argument that businesses cannot afford to go green?" One more time. Uh, so, so what what would you say has been the financial cost of a more sustainable vineyard? Can you disprove the argument that businesses cannot afford to go green? All right, Tobin. So, uh, Taylor Tobin. Uh, hopefully, it's you know, I'm not talking to Tobin James here. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> they, you know, you know, know who that is. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Uh, so. The, 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 the current movement of envir environmental consciousness is causing a shift in the marketplace uh, where you have, for example, more and more restaurants that have a wine list with uh, naturally produced or sustainable organic wines versus traditional wines. More and more restaurants doing that. Mm -hmm. You have a farm to table movement, and I call it, you know, uh, vines, vines to wine. You know, like here, there are the vines, and here is the glass of wine. So there's more and more of that connection taking place. And then I, I'm gonna, in California, there's another one, and that's those are the regulatory uh, mm. requirements. You know, currently, uh, the Water Quality Control Board, which is a regional water board, uh, which is part of Cal EPA, is considering a modification of the irrigated land agriculture requirements and has embedded in it some more stringent requirements uh, associated with fertilized use, pesticide use, in uh, other environmental concern. It's the same with APCD, Air Pollution Control District, DPR, Department of Pest Regulations. We have much more requirements taking place. Uh, likewise, CDFA, California Department of Food and Agriculture. So, you know, we, earlier I talked mostly about the consumer, but there is, Likewise, the whole regulatory framework. In fact, you know, a couple of years in the past, uh, not this year with COVID, but I taught as a visiting lecturer class at Cal Poly, uh, which are taught by uh, an attorney, uh, which is an environmental law class. And I spent a whole day going through mm. the whole list of, as a farmer, all the different regulatory requirements that we have to follow. So I'm suggesting that that's another big force that is coming too. Sure, yeah, definitely. Uh, Adam asks, do they compost on site? If so, how? I imagine you have a lot of green waste that's produced here. Okay, so uh, Adam, our, uh, you know, one of the comp green compost is is actually our cover crop uh, because I, I showed earlier uh, the straw on the ground, but on the disked row, I take the the cover crop and I disk it in the ground, and that's that's called a green compost because you do have fermentation taking place. Uh, because of the, uh, the sugars in, in, in the plant material and it's excellent for microbial production. The, uh, the, uh, the um, stems uh, from our wine production, you know, when we de-stem, we, we spread them in the vineyard, uh, and then those get disked, 
and then the pumice likewise is spread over the vineyard. And that's the skin? That's the skin, thank you, and the seeds. And the seeds. And, and uh, that's spread on the vineyard. And then we buy every year about a, between 150 and 200 tons of compost from Cal Poly. And that is applied on the rows where we have put the pumice. Uh, I have considered a couple of times uh, making our own compost, uh, but you know, to do it right, you got to go through the whole heat treatment, etc. So, uh, applying the stems is a good way, and and then in a very small quantity per acre uh, of a pumice which is basically is a minuscule amount, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we spread it over several acres, so it's not like we're putting two tons per acre of pumice. Um, and uh, as our production of winemaking increase, I was considering incorporating this, this also with a Cal Poly compost as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not all compost are created equal. Um, and uh, I say that because you, you have to really be careful about the heat treatment of your compost, uh, particularly if you're going to be using animal-based compost. And then also the nutrient quality of the compost is important, otherwise you end up just, just buying dead material and, and the nutrient value being quasi non-existent. So mm -hmm. you think you did the right thing, but you didn't. Yeah, it's got to help out, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. One last question here from Hannah. Uh, she has several questions. I think this is probably the most applicable, talking about sustainability. She says, what part of going sustainable was the most difficult? Meaning, was there challenges faced when implementing water conservation, energy conservation, and so on? That, that were more difficult than you thought they might be? Well, one of them was uh, pesticide, uh, pest management, the, the uh, obscure mealybug, uh, because going instantly from, uh, you know, applying di diazinon, uh, you know, first class pesticide to using soft pesticide met that I had to accept the fact that I had mealybugs for several years, although reducing the impact. Uh, so that was a challenge. And then uh, a lot of my uh, irrigation infrastructure, you know, certainly there was a high cost associated with that. Uh, where all my wells are interconnected, I can move water around and control it, in fact, Sometimes people joke with me and say, gee, you know, where you're a steam locomotive engineer where you have all these valves and gauges because I can move water around. Well, there was significant cost uh, associated with that. And, and my water harvesting approach, I mean, I had big uh, caterpillar dozers moving earth around. I mean, when you look at the vineyard, you see, oh, that's a little ditch, that's nice. Well, that's a lot of ground that I had to move to create all that. Yeah. And then you don't see it, all my culverts, some of them go below ground and daylight somewhere else. Uh, that was very significant. And then another cost, which didn't have a direct benefit, is all my creek work, creek habitat improvements. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't translate the, to oh, I can, I can taste your Chardonnay is much nicer now. <laughs> no. Now I know I'm at peace with the environment, mm -hmm. and certainly ecologically bring things in balance. In fact, you know I'm on a, a, a video uh, with uh, Noah, uh, and it was called the South Central Coast uh, Still Had Trout restoration projects I said you know the question was why are you doing all that and I'm like well you know when you st see a steelhead moving upstream again you know you make progress and you're back in balance with nature you don't need scientific instruments to look at what's the dissolved oxygen level of a water uh, what's the TMDL 
total maximum daily load you know, of, of the water. You don't need that. You know you're making progress. Mm -hmm. So it's, this may sound uh, a little bit too organic in the sense of well, you know, these kind of birds and bees things, but you get to these fundamentals, you know, they, they, those are your answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, I appreciate you being such a good yeah. steward of the land. We, we talked about that last week in class, actually being good stewards and, and uh, leaving behind things better than the way you found them. And I think you've done that out here at the winery, so really appreciate that. Uh, appreciate your time, Jean-Pierre. You're welcome. I'll send you a link of the video. All right. <laughs> so Very you know good. Uh, what, you, what you've said today uh, is making an impact on these students. And uh, to all of you students on this, uh, I guess we call it asynchronous class, you know, my best wishes to all of you. And, uh, you know, I'm sure 2020 a little challenging year, but, uh, you know, just continue your ongoing learning uh, and uh, continuous learning. So thank you. Cool. Thanks. All right, man. All right. <laughs>